today, this particular segment, we have Carla Cruz from the Un mm. United Nations uh, Blockchain Commission. Yeah. I think that blockchain is, is a tool. You know, it's a tool to make people aware of, of what other people can do with information, right? It exposes, for example, how the data changes, right? So, talk about Hong Kong, for example. People have said, it's interesting, people have said, wow, who is the leader, right? Where are people actually knowing where to go the next day, right? And it's social media. But is there a way that the person knows, whoever is disseminating the information, what information they're putting out that is actually eliciting so much anger, right? Where is it coming from? And what is the motivation? And it's funny because blockchain, you start with a certain set of information and you see that the data is kept intact through the journey, where it was passed on, how it was edited, by whom. Mm -hmm. um, and it can only be changed if everybody agrees. That's the consensus mechanism that's built into blockchain, mm -hmm. right? So you have something that can, can actually keep track in a ledger of, of, it's not just numbers, right? But it's also data. And that's very important for people to know that it can live on whatever technology, on top of whatever technology. It, it, there is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand that financial services, a lot mm -hmm. of them are already adopt blockchain technology yes, for yes. their compliance mm -hmm. um, requirements, mm -hmm. uh, for their AML requirements and stuff. But let's just talk about data manipulations. Mm -hmm. and, and this is scary yes. that um, we've seen, you know, recently uh, election in some of the country, mm -hmm. they use social media mm -hmm. as an influence, mm -hmm. not to promote, but really to basically influence their vote. Yes. And some of these votes are manipulated you yes. know, by big data. Yes. You know, yes. How does it work? I think it's before the vote, right? Yep. You, you really have to look at everywhere as policy first, as what do countries allow mm -hmm. um, you know, access to or sharing, for example. And if you have a country like the Philippines with 73 million social media users, Okay. Wow, really? 73 million social okay. media. Out of our internet population, we're the only country that's like 98% on Facebook. And Mark Zuckerberg asked, so what happened to the 2%? They're like, oh, they're signing up. <laughs> <laughs> so so okay. it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and right. Facebook is synonymous to, to the internet, yeah. right? So when you have an election that is run, I mean, we're not unique. Indonesia is very, is, you know, this happened also. It's happening in in um, Bangkok, it happened in Thailand, the last Thai elections, yeah. but you have a country like the Philippines that's unique because it's one of two com countries, Philippines and Poland, that allow direct Facebook moderation. So Facebook can moderate a newsfeed, right? That means they can get the data and they can share it, right, to, to developers and all that. Yeah. So a social media game, for example, have backdoors, whether or not they meant to, right? But you have people who will do bad with that. So you have an opening, you take all those people's data, and you can change conversation, right? You, you can change, you can watch my behavior, for example, and you can see I'm, I'm leaning a certain way. My conversations are a certain way. You pick up on all these keywords, right? And you target that person and their psyche to vote differently. So the way it happened here was Rodrigo Duterte was elected in May, right? Right. The U.S. elections was in October, November of the same year. Yeah. Okay. Rappler, or another social news from the Philippines, yeah. was actually monitoring this because they were doing big data very early on. Right. Right? And they had said to their counterparts, your algorithms are moving a certain way to favor another, a, candid a certain candidate. Why is that so? Mm -hmm. They were alerted six times, okay. right? Um, and that was a clear indicator that an intrusion happened. And the results will show you how close it was. Right. Do you understand? I understand. No, I understand. So the, it, they had done it in such so late in the game, right? Uh -huh. Because it's so new. Yeah. So when they, you have to watch it every day, right? And then you have to, you can move the conversation just... You know, I mean, the, the data you put out will, will incite fear and will incite anger, right? So it's, it's really a crowdsourcing emotion. 
Okay. Right? So that's, that's what you, it, it can do good and bad. Right? That's another level of cyber security, cyber crime. Yes. Because this is almost like malware. Yes, okay? exactly. You exactly. input a malware into a computer, you can actually monitor all their data. Correct. And when you decide to hit, you go. You go. Exactly. Right. That's the scariest part. And it, it makes me very angry. Right. You know, because you have a country that doesn't have a national identity system. So we're, we're just Jane Doe's. Have you basically seen governments in um, other places starting to uh, adopt blockchain technology yeah. to yes. defend cybercrime? Yes, actually. So I was part of the group that um, digitized Estonia. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. So we we built the policies and the well, they built the blockchain systems, not me, but for the whole healthcare system. So right. they encrypted the healthcare transactions uh -huh. in the country um, with a, another blockchain, right? Yeah. So like a double permission blockchain to to protect against intrusions or um, and like a China wall in a way, right? right. But um, it's more to monitor and not limit. Right, okay. monitor, yeah, and gather data, but it's kept in the country. I think that's really what's important, right? So Estonia's doing that. Um, Dubai uh -huh. is um, protecting their like their titling, their registry, um, with blockchain encryption as well. So yeah.